In the headlines, service chiefs meet to discuss strategies to free victims of Kaduna train attack. Bandits abduct village head in Kaduna demand petrol recharge cards as ransom. Sokoto government confirms resignation of 13 cabinet members. Away from Nigeria, DRC's state of emergency in North Kivu, Ituri, comes under scrutiny amid rising attacks. Hello and welcome to Trust News Update. I am Ayuba Ilea. Thank you for joining. Beginning with security matters, Chief of Defence Staff General Loki Irabo, Inspector General of Police Usman Baba and other service chiefs on Thursday met behind closed doors at force headquarters in Abuja. The strategic meeting is part of the efforts by the heads of security forces to free passengers of Abuja Kaduna bound train who were abducted exactly a month ago. Reports say that pressure is mounting on the security agencies to free the captives before Ido Fitter or be sanctioned by President Muhammad Buhari. In, the same vein, in a similar vein, bandits have abducted the village head of Rijana, Ayubadoro Dakolo, in Kachia local government area of Kaduna State. The village head was abducted alongside other farmers at Kurmi near Chikwale in the same local government area. Daily Trust reports that the bandits have reached out to community leaders in Rijana, demanding gallons of petrol engine oil, recharge cards, as well as cigarettes as ransom. The Kaduna State Police Command is yet to confirm the incident. An instructor with the Nigerian Army Battalion in Gaidam, Yobe State, Lance Corporal Jibreen has committed suicide. He took his life after he was arrested for allegedly conniving with Boko Haram insurgents who attacked Yobe communities recently. Jibreen, who disappeared from his duty post a few days ago, was said to have been cited among Boko Haram terrorists that attacked Gaidam town last week. Military sources said that the soldier was tracked by Army Intelligence Unit and was found in Geshua, some 100 kilometers from his duty post on Tuesday. When contacted, Army spokesman, headquarters of Sector 2 Operation Hat in Kaidamaturu, Lieutenant Kennedy Anyau confirmed the incident. Now, eight years after the initial kidnapping of Chibok schoolgirls, Nigeria has failed the more than 100 girls still in captivity. The incident was described by observers as a major embarrassment to the then administration due to its lethargic response. It is, however, more disturbing today how these young promising ladies are left to the mercy of their abductors. In this report, Fatima Karai walks us down memory lane in sad remembrance of the forgotten schoolgirls. The report. Raped, beaten, tortured, and left days without food were some of the terrors these innocent schoolgirls had to endure for no faults of theirs. Since their abduction eight years ago, life in this small unknown community, Chibok, in Borno State, has been difficult and unbearable without their daughters. This small community has no electricity, no good roads, and no health facility, yet it has to carry the heaviest burden on its fragile shoulders. Rachel Daniel is one of the parents of the schoolgirls still in captivity. She says although she is thankful for those girls that return home, she feels that the government can do more to bring the remaining students back to their families. This thing has affected my health. I am on drugs now. I never thought I would be able to sit like this. It has really taken a toll on my life. I am begging the government to please help us so that we can reunite with our children. Since the incident, Chibok and the region have witnessed attack and destruction that has damaged the people both physically and mentally. And this evil act had slowly spread to the other parts of the country forcing many schools to close. According to Amnesty International, more than 1,500 children have been kidnapped and reports from UNICEF indicate that about one million school children are afraid to go to school as a result of violence. 
Dokas Musa was among many girls kidnapped in Baga local government area of Borno State in 2014. They were rescued by the Nigerian military after spending more than a year in terrorist Sambisa enclave. Dokas considered her life ruined and government has not been able to secure justice for her. This is not life. We suffered in the hands of the terrorists. I have been raped. Now I have a daughter, and there is no help from any quarters. A non governmental human rights organization in Meduguri speaks. What baffles me is that people are just focused on the return of extremists who are coming back in thousands. How do we rehabilitate them? How do we reintegrate them? Then, how do you rehabilitate and reintegrate and then cater for those, the offspring that these people have come back with without any responsibility to them? For this mother, and many like her. Will they ever be united with their children? And for this young woman trying to pick up the shattered pieces of her life, she said it is difficult, but takes one day at a time. This is a desperate cry for help and for justice. This is a cry for those parents that have no voice. So remember the 109 Chibok schoolgirls and many more. Fatima Arai, Trust TV News. Talking in security, at least 113 cattle were rustled and 200, two herders injured during a renewed attack around Bara village in Tahu ward of Basa local government area of Plateau State. Chairman of Gang Allah Fulani Development Association of Nigeria in Basa, Abu Bakr Abdullahi Buba said six cattle were also shot dead by the rustlers. Spokesperson of Operation Save Heaven, a multi-security task force maintaining peace in the state, confirmed the incident, explaining that Sector 3 of Operation Save Heaven has contacted the two groups and some cows have been recovered while amicable settlement is ongoing. He urged them not to take the law into their hands as efforts are on to arrest perpetrators. Now, three people were electrocuted to death after a fault in a power transmission line in Gombe State. The incident involving more than 10 people happened at midnight in Tumfure within Gombe Metropolis. Idris uh, Ibrahim Ismail reports. These families are in mourning following the unfortunate power incident that left three people dead. They are one man, a mother and her child. Ten people among the survivors sustained various degrees of injuries. Like me, I was about to go back to carry my gate key when my fridge hold me and threw me off. The other house opposite me, the fridge hold the woman and her daughter. Um, so the fire is a fire outbreak around some minutes ago, we just had a sound. So I'm coming to see that the fire, fire engulfed the house. And we are able to save the children. After saving the children, we came out thinking that it's only the house, only for us to find out that it's everywhere. Okay. It's so fire up and down, all the houses, and uh, in the process, um, some people lost their lives, which is, which, is, which is a very, very sad one. They lost their lives. Actually, it's a sad one. Abu Yusuf lost a brother in the incident. He is calling on authorities of just electricity distribution company Jet in Gombe State to take responsibility for the incident. Let Jet do the right thing. Let them come and take care of all the casualties, all the meters that bound here. They should replace them without requesting anything. And they should make sure they pay. They pay completely what people lost here. And we're going to take absolute and complete data. Inventory. Gombe said governor in Wahia who sympathize with the families of the victims and give financial assistance vowed to ensure justice 
for the victims. And I address the family members directly, and I can see the outside there are a lot of graves now waiting to hear what we promise that we shall pursue this justice a lot, and inshallah there will be no repeat of such a case. And I've had the youth to come down and await for the outcome of the security. Residents of Tumfure who attributed the incident to faulty power connection said Jet is responsible. When contacted, the management of Just Electricity Distribution Company, Gombe Office, said the incident was natural disaster. From Gombe, Ibrahim Ismail, reporting for Trust TV. A member of the National Youth Service Corps, NYSC, deployed to Abuja, Stephanie Seimba Terungwa, have been found dead. She was reported missing before her corpse was found in Abuja. The NYSC Director of Press and Public Relations, Eddie Megua, disclosed this in a statement on Thursday. Megua said the body of the late core member was found in NYSC khaki trouser with the face defaced beyond recognition. Moving on to political matters, Governor Aminu Waziri Tambul of Sokoto State has accepted the resignation of 13 key portfolio holders in his administration. The secretary to the state government, Saeed Umar, and the chief of staff, Mokhtar Umar Magori, have both tendered their resignation, while 11 commissioners have also indicated their desire to quit the Sokoto State Cabinet. The commissioners are resigning their appointments to contest for various elective offices. A press statement signed by Mokhtar Umar Magori, special advisor, media and publicity to the governor, confirmed the resignations and that Governor Tambwal is also aspiring for an elective position as president of Nigeria. Bayelsa State Government has threatened to sanction government appointees who criticize or oppose former President Goodluck Jonathan's rumored bid to run for 2023 presidential election under the platform of the All Progressives Congress. The statement commissioner for the State Commissioner for Information, Orientation and Strategy, Aimbaina Duba, in a statement on Thursday, condemned uh, Governor Doediri's Chief Press Secretary. Daniel Alabra's social media post opposing former president's ambition warned that the state government will not hesitate to take drastic action against any appointee who throws a caution into the wind, fails to respect his office and conduct himself in a manner that may put the governor in disrepute. It, it has not yet been ascertained if Governor Deary may likely join the former president in APC if later eventually declare for 2023 presidential race and they come to the party. You're watching Trust News Update coming up shortly. Health and safety in the workplace. Details and more after the break. Join us again. Welcome back. You're watching Trust News Update. Let's take a look at the top stories again. Service chiefs meet to discuss strategies to free victims of Kaduna train attack. Bandits abduct village head in Kaduna, demand petrol, recharge cards as ransom. Now, moving on, Gombe State says it has recorded six deaths from Lhasa fever outbreak in Kaltungo local government area of the state. 
Coordinator of Primary Health Care Centers in Kaltogo Local Government, Comfort and Lamy, said the outbreak was confirmed on April 11th and occurred at an Almajiri school in Dogon Rua Ward. Speaking during an advocacy visit to the parlors of the May Kaltungo, Saleh Mohammed, she explained that the new outbreak was discovered when five students of the Almajiri school became ill and were taken to a hospital. The five suspected cases were confirmed dead, while their teacher later fell ill, and it was confirmed to be Lassa fever, and he also died that same day. She further said that her team had embarked on sensitization in the community, while tracing suspected cases and those who came in contact with the confirmed cases in the community and its environs. Now, every year on the 28th of April, the International Day for Safety and Health in the Workplace is celebrated. This year's celebration is themed Act Together to Build a Positive Safety and Health Culture, focusing focuses on enhancing social dialogue towards a culture of safety and health. Chiamaka Mwafo has more. April 28, a day dedicated by the International Labour Organization, ILO, to celebrate safety and health in the workplace. ILO began the observance of the World Safety and Health Day in the year 2003 to prevent accidents and diseases at work. The day also coincides with the international commemoration for the dead and injured workers celebrated by the trade union movement since 1996. According to Alanza Giwa, Head, Media Occupational Safety and Health Association, the need for safety goes beyond the workplace. Giwa, who spoke on Trust TV's morning show, Daybreak, added that all organizations are meant to have a health, safety and environment department. Work hazards can occur everywhere in your house. Mm -hmm. So it, um, the day for safety doesn't just emphasize this on just the workplaces, mm -hmm. but if you're in your house and you're cooking, that is your office for the time being. Okay. If you're in your house, I mean, that's your work. Because life, everywhere you go, there, the, there's need to safety. My boss always say that um, safety is not just something you do for a time. Safety should be a lifestyle, something you do consistently without relenting. For those who are working like uh, on a standard level, organizations need to have um, a HSC personnel, a HSC responsible, someone that is responsible for health and safety in an organization. And it's a shame that not every organization have that. Matter of fact, some organizations are not uh, totally oblivious of what that entails. While explaining the roles of both employer and employee, Giwa said, it was the duty of the Ministry of Labour to implement and enforce safety and health at workplaces in Nigeria. The Federal Ministry of Labour and Employment has the mandate, the have a Department for Occupational Safety and Health, which has a sole mandate to ensure the localization and enforcement of that. And although we are not really there yet, it's actually a call for them to step into action proper so that we don't just have policies, but we have policies that are actually working. The employer in itself has a role, as I mentioned earlier, to ensure that people are adhere to the rules and regulations as it entails safety to provide all the necessary means but it doesn't end there it has to do with the employee also enacting and adopting those rules barrister ezekiel ugochuku is a legal practitioner he tells us the position of the law in nigeria as it relates to accidents in the workplace he spoke in a telephone chart we have laws guiding them the labor law is able to act accommodate the rights of employees an employer um, has an obligation to ensure that uh, the condition of the office, of the workplace, is in such a way that we must cause injury to the workers. If he falls in such, in such duty, in our, the least, he can be held liable for failing in his obligation to provide a safe place for workers. With the above in mind, how safe is your workplace for employees as an employer? And as an employee, do you adhere to the safety regulations? Interesting report there. Safety is key. Emir of Lafia, retired Justice C.D. Bage Mohammed, has called on wealthy individuals in Nassar State to assist the less privileged 
in the society. He made the call during a donation of cash and food items to the less privileged at his palace in Lafia. Our worker Abdullahi has more. Disbursement of the cash and food items to the less privileged, courtesy Zakat and Wakaf Committee of Lafia Local Government Area, was part of efforts to cushion the effects of the present economic hardship facing the people. Speaking, Emir of Lafia, retired Justice C.D. Baigi Mohammed, who reminded Muslims and wealthy individuals on the need to give their zakat to the needy in society, as enshrined in the Quran, noted that failure to do so attracts punishment from God. It's a, a religious obligation ordained by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has himself created social security. He created it so that there will be order and fair distribution of wealth across the entire human race. Retired Justice Muhammad explained that the essence of giving out zakat is to ensure social justice, foster love between wealthy individuals and the poor, as well as reduce begging and poverty in the society. On his part, Chairman Zakat and Work of Committee in Lafia Local Government Area and former State Chief Judge of Nasara State, Justice Badamasi Mena, lauded the support and cooperation that the committee has been receiving since its inauguration and assured that the committee will continue to sensitize relevant stakeholders to ensure its core mandate is achieved. Secretary of the committee, Aliu Shaibu, revealed that the beneficiaries were carefully selected based on their peculiar needs, adding that over 70 people have benefited from the gesture. The federal government has been called upon to ensure that fares for the 2022 annual Hajj are affordable to enable more Muslims participate in the annual ritual. A cleric, Colonel Adamu Giribu, retired, who led this year's tafsir at the Jibouis Mosque in Lafia, Nazara State, made a call while closing the tafsir. The report. Recently, at its meeting with chief executives of state Muslim Pilgrims Welfare Boards, the National Hajj Commission of Nigeria, NACON, projected the sum of 2.5 million naira for the 2022 Hajj. This follows the lifting of the ban on Hajj performance by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia on April 17, 2022. Speaking on the development, an Islamic cleric, Colonel Adam Girbo, retired, said that Hajj fair pegged by Nakon is beyond the reach of many Muslims who may wish to perform the Hajj. They are talking about 2.5 million naira for the sake of God. It will take how many years for poor persons to accumulate this amount? We are begging the federal government with the voice of entire Nigerian Muslims to reduce the fare to enable many to visit the Holy Land to pray for the nation. At the Al Makura Mosque, where Malang Abdullahi Aliu led the tafsir, the cleric urged believers to use the lessons learnt during the Ramadan to continue living in accordance with the teaching of Islam. That is why people are advised to engage in good activities because on the Day of Judgment, every individual will rise up and give account of his world activity, be it good or bad. The Islamic cleric explained that the call for a reduction in the fare is due to the large number of Muslims performing this month's lesser hajj, as well as the now-lifted two-year ban on hajj, noting that if the fares are too high, many Muslims will be denied the opportunity of taking part in the exercise. And away from Nigeria, the state of emergency imposed in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo has come under scrutiny and debate. It comes as more than 2,500 civilians have been reportedly killed in two eastern provinces on the siege, nearly double the number killed a year earlier. Prime Minister Jean-Michel Sama Lokonde, in an interview on Tuesday, said the state of siege and the army's operations have made it possible to reduce the area of action of the negative forces. But elected officials are angry and the measure is increasingly being debated. Lokonde told RFI on Tuesday the authorities are considering a reclassification of the zone where the measure will be maintained given that the abuses are taking place in specific areas. 
And in sports news, Dutch cyclist Amy Peters has regained consciousness and can communicate slightly non-verbally for months after a crash in training. Peters suffered severe brain damage after falling during a training camp in Alicante in December. After undergoing surgery, she was put into an induced coma and transferred to a Netherlands hospital in January. In a statement, her team, SD Works, said Peter's condition had changed, but her long-term outlook remains unknown. Alongside Kristen Wild, Peters had become the Madison World Champion for a third consecutive year and also won stage two of the women's tour in 2021. She also won the Dutch National Road Race and Nokra Kosa in Belgium last year. And that's that for the news update. But before we go, here is a key cap. An overhead and overhead conversation on an aeroplane change Britain Zimb Zambezi's life. The former technician is now one of Zimbabwe's pioneering black soldier fly Margot Farmers, rearing the files to produce affordable chicken feed for farmers. Take a look. <laughs> Basic farming, it is uh, the, uh, the farming of flies, the black soldier fly. Uh, I started basic farming in 2018 by researching. Uh, it took me the, the whole year researching uh, basic farming. Then in 2019, I started uh, basic farming. Usually they uh, love to hide their eggs. This is a very, very sensitive uh, insect. It's a very, very insect, uh, sensitive insect. So they lay eggs in the, the cardboard boxes. So from this side, we come to the growing area. When we leave our tray uh, with eggs, we, we leave it for four to five days uh, to hatch. Uh, after hatching, we will come to see things like this. This is what we call BSF mangoes. Besides teaching people about BSA farming, I also sell chicks. I uh, also send seed to Botswana. As, as, uh, as far as Botswana, uh, Mozambique, and, uh, and South Africa. My flies are under my name From se seven days going up, uh, it will be ready to feed our animals, either our chickens, or our pigs, or anything that we need to feed. This is a free Come and join and uh, make your own feed. At no cost, only labor you need on basic farming. And this is protein, 4% uh, and above of protein content. And with that, we wrap up Trust News Update, but you can watch more by clicking the subscribe button on our YouTube page and also connecting with us via all social media platforms. I am Ayuba Ilya. Thank you for watching.